So, I'm supposed to talk to you about lots of different things. And one of the things I want to talk to you about is finding the hero inside yourself. And let's go back to when you were made, each of you. How many of you out there are athletes? Wow. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Take care of those good bodies of yours. So, when you were conceived, there was one egg that your mother provided. Now remember, those eggs, those eggs were inside your mother when she was born. All of them. About, what, 400,000? Yep, and you only use a few. But every month you pop one out, you ripen one. It's called luteinizing, but we won't get technical. There was one egg. But when your parents decided to make you, and I don't need to tell you the details of that today, I think you all know. <laughs> so when your parents made you, there were 500 to 700 million sperm. And the one that became you won the marathon of life. Think about that. Have, have any of you ever run a marathon against 500,000 people? The answer is yes. There were 500,000 of those little guys and they were all trying to get to the egg. And the very best, the very healthiest, the very brightest, the very most miraculous sperm got to that egg and that egg let in the best one. Because a lot of them get there at the same time. But the egg chose the best one and that became you. So from the very start, every single one of you, every single one of you is a hero. Do you believe me? Yeah? Come on, tell me. <laughs> yeah? You feel it? <laughs> so carry that with you. Carry that with you. We'll talk about a few things today. But I want to tell you that when you go home today, even before you do your other homework, if you don't already know your birth story, please ask your parents about how you were born. About what your mom was feeling and thinking while you were inside growing under her heart. And no matter what your story is, it's a miraculous story. Those of you that do know your birth story, talk about it with your family. Now go back to that time when you were the most precious, amazing, miraculous being in the world. Because after that nine months of growing inside your mother, there was that moment where you met your parents and they looked into your eyes. And even all the love that they gave you when you were growing inside them, and I will admit some people didn't get enough love when they were growing inside their mothers. But no matter what happened when they were growing inside, when they met those people that were going to take care of them, so much love took place when their eyes met. So right now I'm going to have you take a little risk because I believe at Bumi Sehat that we save lives because of love. People say, why did your project end up getting to be picked by CNN? And I say, because our secret is we practice with love. In 2011, 33,382 incidents of patient care Educational and human services took place at our two clinics. And that's a, just a little grassroots organization starting out with a dream. Just a little organization in, a, in the country of Indonesia on a small, small island. And then we went out to the tsunami zone. We went to the, to the big, big disaster there and we're still there. We still have a clinic there. We were at Padang after the earthquake in 2006. We were in Jogja in 2008, and we were in Haiti in 2010. And it's just a bunch of people who really care, who really are willing to go out there on the edge and do whatever needs to be done for the greater good, supported by a whole lot of people who are family all over the world, many of them here in your town of Fairfield. We were supported by them to go out and do that work. Because whereas we're the hands out in the field, the people that actually pay for those health care and educational services, they're the heart. They're the ones that pump the, the rich nutrients. They're the ones that pump the blood into our hands so that we can go out there in the field and do the work. And people ask me, how did it start? How did you become a hero? I always say, hero shmiro. I'm just a grandma and a midwife. But 
If I go back to when I was your age, all of you, I had visions and I had dreams and I had secrets and I had precious things that I really held in my heart and I nurtured them like a baby. And I really cared about what I thought I might do in the world if I could just do it, if I could just study hard enough and care and love with an open enough heart, then maybe I could make the world a little bit of a better place. And I found that there was a time in my life where I was really kind of angry and I was itchy and I felt like I couldn't do it. And how could I do it? And who would let me do it? And I think that has to do with our pineal glands right up here at the top of your head. If you touch the top of your head, go ahead and touch the top of your head. Just under there, we have a very special gland as human beings. It's called the pineal gland. And it's the very crown of our immune systems. And that pineal gland is really, really, really delicate. And you want to protect it. You want to care for it. Because the people in other parts of the world believe that that's the seat of your soul. And when you're a teenager, it's enlarged. Which could be translated to mean that when you're a teenager, you're actually in a very spiritual, spiritual part of your life. Your soul is waking up and saying, wow, I want to stretch and grow and do something in the world. So teenagers feel quite itchy. They feel like they got to do something. Do you feel that way? Do you feel a bit itchy? Like you want to go on to the next step? You want to sh just fly like a rocket ship? How many of you feel that way? Come on, really? How many of you feel really hormonal? <laughs> go ahead, admit it. I bet you all feel that way. Well, that's your pineal gland, which is driving your whole, all your hormones, your whole endocrine system. So there's actually a physical reason that you feel itchy. That inspiration means not that you shouldn't hook up with someone and go get them pregnant. I'm sorry. Bad idea. I mean, you could do that, and some of you will, but bad idea. <laughs> and if you do that, you take care of that baby. I was a teenage mom. I did finish high school. And when I became a teenage mom, I realized that there was a whole lot wrong with what was happening to mothers and babies in our world. Right here in the United States. Do you know that we are now number 50 for maternal mortality in the world? Number 50. That means it's safer to have a baby in 49 other countries other than the United States. And those 49 other countries, they spend less money on childbirth technology. They're much more grassroots. They use midwives, and when the midwives find something is going wrong with the mother, the midwives hold her hand and take her to the specialist and say to the doctor, you need to pay attention to this mom. I talked to a mom right here in Fairfield yesterday. And at 34 weeks, she had her baby prematurely because she had such terrible hypertension. She saw her doctor three days before that. He didn't seem to think there was anything wrong. Her baby ended up for six or seven weeks in intensive care over at University of Iowa. Now, how come along the way, there couldn't be a way to help her hold on to her pregnancy so she wouldn't give birth to such a premature baby? so that her blood pressure wouldn't go up to 203 over 110. It's a, it's a miracle she's alive and her baby are alive. But I feel like if she had midwives, if she had someone who would spend time with her and listen to her and explain to her what her blood pressure means and how she could make it better and how she could eat wholesome food and drink plenty of water and get good rest and lower her stress level so that she could hold her baby long enough so that they would both be healthy. But instead, she had a doctor that would spend less than five minutes with her. Those doctors are way too busy. And because in the state of Iowa, being a midwife is still a felony. I mean, CNN picked me to be one of the top ten heroes, and then everybody in the world who voted, and there were over six million of them, decided to pick me as number one. But I'm an Iowan. I vote by absentee ballot. Even though I live in Indonesia, I vote here in Iowa. 
I still pay my taxes. I have a little house here in Iowa, in Jefferson County. And yet, if I come home here to Iowa and do what I do, and I have all these accolades for doing it internationally, if I do what I do right here at home in Iowa, I could go to prison for 20 years. Imagine that. So you, as people coming of age, you're going to be voting soon. Some of you may have, how many have you already voted? Did you get to vote? Congratulations, your first time, huh? So those of you that are coming of age, you need to decide what your human rights are and say, you know what, I want, when I have my children, to be able to choose. I want my children, when they have their babies, to be able to choose. You know, we can decongest the hospitals, we can make it better for mothers and babies if we just decriminalize midwifery in this state. 35 other states would honor what I do and what midwives do and have brought them into the healthcare system and they have better results. So healthcare is a human right, but it costs money. And that's all of our problem. You know, the health care that we provide free at our clinics in Indonesia and in disaster zones, they cost somebody money. And that's the open-hearted, loving donors, the people who give a little bit every month or for whatever. When they have some, they give some to make sure that the lost, the last, and the least in my part of the world have a chance to have a healthy baby. So I kind of want to get into your questions. Do you have some questions? Anybody have a burning question? Don't be shy. I know I'm up on this stage, and, but I'm just like you. Any questions? Come on. Where's that? Oh, hi. Shout it out. How many patients did you serve a day? <laughs> a lot, a lot. Now. If you think about 33,382, now some of those are kids we put in school. We've made over 40, in the last few years, we've made over 40 new midwives. We've paid their tuition, their school books, their clothes, their transportation, their housing, their food, everything from the poorest families. We have made nurses, we've made teachers. So they count as one per year. But think about two clinics and 33,000. 382 incidents of patient care and educational services. So you can walk in that clinic and it will be very, very, very busy. We also do something very unique in that we have, you know, those holistic practitioners like chiropractors and acupuncturists and cranial sacral therapists and physiotherapists. We have them working with our doctors and nurses and midwives. So we have a blend of holistic medicine and allopathic medicine which is so much fun. You know, it gives those doctors, when they find a high-risk situation and they want to, to find an alternative method to help that person, they can just walk right over and talk to the acupuncturist and say, hey, what do you think? i got this patient over here and her blood pressure is off the scale. Can we do something? Yes, let's try together. So we work together very much. So in terms of babies being born, you know, once in a while we have that day where there's no babies being born, and we know that tomorrow's going to be a huge avalanche. I think our record was 11 babies in one night, and we're a small clinic. You could fit our clinic about three times in this room, huh? Maybe more. Yeah. So, I mean, I felt bad because the people that work in the administration office came in in the morning, and there was a mother with her nursing her baby. We put sheets on the couch in the office. <laughs> We moved a couple of them to my house across the road and down. Um, so sometimes it can be really crazy busy. I have a friend that's really weird. She's into that astrology stuff. And whenever there's really a busy time at the clinic, she'll go home and look on her computer and she'll say, oh, the stars were beautiful. And when it's slow and nobody wants to be born, she'll say, ah, the stars are so ugly. I'm glad no one's being born. So most of you, I'm sure, picked really beautiful stars that you wouldn't be sitting here. More, did I answer your question? Sometimes it's really busy. Most of the time it's really busy. And we're open 24-7 in both the clinics. We never close. And we never turn anyone away. We always say there's always room at the inn. 
no matter how many people in labor, no, how many, no matter how full our birth rooms are. And then we got people giving birth in the doctor room. We got people giving birth in the recovery room. There's always room at the inn. Always. And we're about to open some childbirth mangers actually in the Philippines. So we're going to expand. Yes, hi. Hi, Robin. Do you know anything about the Summer Hill study? Yes, yeah, the Summer Hill study. So you guys can Google this. What they proved is that whatever you were good at when you were younger, when you were your age, and even younger, even before middle school, even when you were really little, what you were good at and what you loved then is what you will be really good at and succeed in as an adult. It's also what will make you the happiest. So those of you that are into music, who's a musician here? Wow, you guys have a lot of musicians. That's so great. I love musicians. Give yourself a hand. If you're good at music, hold on to that. Music is a superpower. How many, and we had a lot of athletes here? Athletes? Hang on to that, that's a superpower. What, how many of you are good at math? Nice, lots of nerds. I was a nerd. I was so unpopular and such a nerd because I love math, you know. I went to chess club. I was really weird. I was fighting for women's rights when I was in high school. Math, mathematics is a superpower. So th those things that you love now and those things that you excel in now are all part of that dream that you're nurturing. And that dream is what is going to be born into the world and what you're going to do as a hero. Yes, question over here? You guys, uh, do you think the rights for people other than athletes, um, like you were just talking about? Yes. Do we, do we do things for rights for people? Mm -hmm. Well, our rights for people is one is health care is a human right, so we provide free health care. We feel that education is a human right, so the people from the, the kids from the poorest families that have a vision and they really want to be something, usually a teacher, a midwife, or a nurse. We ha can't really afford medical school yet, but I'm sure if that happens, we'll get there. We will support them because we believe it's a human right. We have a youth center in Aceh in the tsunami zone and one in Bali. Now remember, Bali had terrorist bombings in 2002 and 2005. And so we have those youth centers, we teach all kinds of things. Computer skills to people who otherwise would never have an opportunity to even touch a computer. Uh, we teach English language. Uh, we teach, for example, family life and sex education. We teach music. And we teach organic farming because there's no food security in Indonesia. You guys are lucky here. There are so many organic farmers in this area. Yes, you had a question. Um, do you have to go through a special field of study or get a, do any classes to become a midwife in Indonesia? Hi. What's your name? Uh, Jorge. 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 Hi, Jorge. Hello. I love that name. <laughs> Sorry, what was your name? The one that asked the question earlier? Adam. Hi, Adam. So Jorge wanted to know, is there a special uh, course of study to become a midwife in Indonesia? And the answer is yes. It's a very difficult, difficult schooling, but well worth it. I have to say that mo it's because it's so expensive to get an education in Indonesia that the children who get an education are from wealthier families. The poorest kids almost never get an education, which is why we support so many. But yes, and in the United States, there are many really good midwifery programs. Seattle School of Traditional Midwifery. You have the one at Sunny Brook College in New York. Do we have any midwifery colleges in Iowa? I don't think so. We don't. And you know why we don't? Because we made midwifery a crime. Now, if you talk to your senior citizens in the state of Iowa, your elderly policemen and politicians and doctors, they were born at home. Back when your country doctor and his wife, who is usually a nurse, will come to your house. So why is it important to have a gentle birth? Why is it important for families 
and mothers to be to have a choice where they want to have their babies it's it's important because if you're gently born then you have less childbirth trauma if you're born without trauma there's plenty of research and you can google it there's plenty of research that proves that those people born without trauma can more easily live with an intact capacity to love and trust and what does that translate into that translates into right away in your young life you already have good self-esteem you're much more able to excel it's like having a secret wonderful blessing in your life you get to excel right away yes there are several people back here asking what reason do they give for making uh, being a midwife a crime I don't know I don't know that's a really good question I think that it's money. it's money okay someone up here who has worked um, in a consumer group to advocate for the de- decriminalization of midwifery in Iowa says it's money it, there's such a small fraction of people being born into the hands of midwives in this country but I do a lot of speaking for example every year in Italy where 85% of the people born in Italy were born into the hands of midwives they spend a lot less money on health care in Italy on reproductive health care and they have better results fewer mothers die and fewer babies are damaged or die so it might have a lot to do with a certain club of people that feel like if they can keep a monopoly on reproductive health remember the hospitals are full of sick people and then most of the people who are there to have their babies are actually healthy so it's much more fun and much more profitable to take care of the healthy people and charge a lot of money midwives are there to be the guardians of normal natural birth if it's no longer normal if the mom's not healthy enough then she needs to be in the hospital but I feel like because we have a health care crisis in this country we do need to decongest our hospitals we do need to save our doctors very special care for the people that are not well and let's give the healthy women to the midwives let's take the moms who are on welfare the moms who need special help from the government in order to get through their lives at that time in their lives let's put them in the care of midwives we'll save a lot of money they'll get a lot better care and if they need special help it's a midwife that's going to be able to identify that risk yes who are some of your heroes oh some of my heroes uh, Vandana Shiva in India she's the mother of organic culture she won the alternative Nobel Peace Prize uh, she's about this big and she's really she's really great what she told me is is that because of the way that food is grown in India because of white rice which is a hybrid which the rats don't even want to eat it because of that there are 5,000 children or more dying with a full belly they're dying of malnutrition in India every day so she's one of my heroes Ina Mae Gaskin she was a midwife out in Tennessee she's still out there she wrote the book spiritual midwifery I'm sure they have it in the Fairfield library and she started out very small working with country doctors and they have documented seven over 7,000 births in Tennessee with better outcomes than births in the hospitals so Ina Mae Gaskin she also won the alternative Nobel Peace Prize the right livelihood award in Sweden just this in 2011 as well hmm well, well Marie Zenick here in town is one of my heroes because she teaches natural family planning and she was a teacher um, a teacher of Spanish language she's one of my heroes uh, and I would say and I know this will surprise you my children are my heroes I just admire them so much they've done wonderful things they came along and worked in the tsunami zone they even did body recovery in the tsunami zone some of my children uh, they've done media support for our nonprofit organization my son Hanuman who's only 19 now he uh, went and became an emergency medical technician an EMT and uh, his first day back we had a child at the clinic who was dying in respiratory arrest a five-year-old boy and uh, they called our house Hanuman was asleep he had jet lag he just made that trip all the way from California to Indonesia 
and he came running down the stairs in boxer shorts and a holy t-shirt and he got there and he saved that kid's life and he's also an incredible violin player and he started learning right here so my children are my heroes hold on yes I think uh, the students here need to know how they can make a bigger impact on the lives of others what made you uh, know that you could make a bigger difference in the lives of others throughout the world at, at the age that you're at now, so the question was, what made me know that I could make a bigger impact on the lives of others? And I would say that at your age, I didn't know that I could do it. I'm still not sure I can do it. <laughs> but I wanted to do it. And I held on to that, that, that passion. I really wanted to change the world. I would, I would write speeches and letters to government and how we could have less poverty, that how we could have fewer bombs, how we could make the world a safer place. And when I read the research that showed that people born without trauma more easily grow up to be the stewards of our air and our land and our water, I went, wow, this is important. And so I picked this one thing. I picked health care, I picked midwifery care, I decided that in my lifetime I would look after the mothers and the babies, the smallest citizens of the world. And I would start one baby at a time. I wouldn't look at the whole picture every day, I would look at the small picture. So whatever it is that you love, whatever it is that makes your heart really happy, what makes you sing and makes you whistle, that's the thing that you're going to be able to do in this world best and that will make you happy. Also, do what makes you happy. I love what I do. I know I grumble sometimes at 3 in the morning when the phone rings and I have to jump on my bicycle and get down to that clinic because somebody might be dying. And I haven't slept in four nights and I thought, finally, tonight I'm going to get to sleep through the night and no, I don't get to. I grumble a little bit, but I love it. Someone over here had their hand up. Hi. Yes, tell me your name. Hi, Kara. So you said that like, on average doctors would spend five minutes with patients, but how much time would you like spend normally spend? Oh, our midwives, they spend a lot of time. You know, I think an average midwifery visit is at least half an hour. I know sometimes an hour will go by, and we have a lot of people. I think about it. We have sometimes in one day 50 or more people coming just for, just for a prenatal checkup. And they get to do free prenatal yoga at our place. And they spend time. But that's why we have so many midwives. We have a team of 11 Indonesian midwives and myself and then some other volunteers from other places in the world. So we spend a tremendous amount of time. And we really look in their eyes. We really know who they are. You know? And all of our patients, I don't care if they're there because they have cancer and they're getting special treatments from our acupuncturist, or they, have, they come in because they have malaria, whatever they're there for, they all have my phone number. And sometimes that's crazy. But it's important. Yes? Could you tell the story about uh, what love can make a difference in the birth process? Yes. Well, how can love make a difference in the birth process? So I'll tell, for example, the story of a day we were at the clinic and there were four people all pushing their babies at once. So it was getting crazy. And we only had two midwives there, so we quickly got other midwives to come in. We were saying, come on in, we need, we need you to come in. I know it's not your ship, get over here. So there we were. And there was one mother, Ibu Rusmini, who was having her second baby, and her, she had her first baby with us. We weren't worried about her, although we were very aware of the fact that she was really poor. Like, she eats a handful of white rice with some coconut oil and salt on it every day. That's about it. If she has that handful of rice twice a day, that's a good day. She's that poor. But since she didn't have a complication at her first birth, we thought, she's going to be okay. So we were really paying more attention. The senior, senior midwives were all helping the high-risk moms. And we had a younger midwife there with her, watching over her. And of course, she would call in another senior midwife when it was time for the baby to be born. But that young midwife came to me and said, Ibu Robin, something's wrong with Ibu Rusmini's baby. The heartbeat's not right. So I, of course left the mom who just had her baby with other midwives, washed my hands, and went into Ibu Rusmini's 
room where she's giving birth. And the normal heart rate of a baby before he or she is born is 120 to 160 beats per minute. Okay? This is why you should always be very loving when you're around a new baby because their heart is still beating at about 130. And so they don't have a filter. They feel love so profoundly. They also feel negative energy very profoundly. So when you're around those new babies, really give them love. Put off good feelings of love because they can feel it. They can read your mind because their heart is beating so fast. And so here this baby's heartbeat was only 40. So I was pretty worried. We had the mom turn over on her side. We gave her oxygen. And we told her, you know, you need to give birth pretty fast. And fortunately, her cervix was fully dilated. So it was time for her to push. But because she was so malnourished, she, wasn't, she didn't have a lot of push in her. She didn't have a lot of energy. So we gave her some spoons of honey and we told her, push. You know, usually we like to slow it way down. And you saw in the film, we were singing and mom's breathing. And we're saying, take your time. There's no hurry. But in this case, we're going, we need to help your baby and we can't help your baby unless you get your baby out quickly because the baby was dying and so she's trying to push, she's trying to push and one of our midwives from the island of Timor I don't know if you know about Timor Leste, it's the newest country in the world it used to be East Timor and they seceded from Indonesia, they got their freedom and she's just a brilliant midwife and she said, wait we almost forgot our secret and she looked right at that mom and she said to her, I love you. And the mom smiled. And she said, I love you too. And we all started hugging and saying, I love you. And her husband, who was sitting behind her, hugged her and kissed her and said, I love you. Which he probably doesn't do very often. And I took the Doppler and I listened. And that baby's heart rate was 120. It was normal. So that baby was saved by love. And he was born with some major um, deformities. He has a cleft palate, hair lip, and he's now up to five kilos, so he'll soon be having surgery. We found a way for him to get the surgery for free through another nonprofit organization, and uh, he'll be fine. But his parents, when they saw that his face was very, very not normal, they didn't care. They just fell in love with him. They were just so happy that he was able to survive because of love. And they will tell anyone, this baby is a miracle of love. And the mother can't even breastfeed because the baby can't suck because the baby doesn't have proper lips. So she pumps her breasts so that she can give her baby her own milk from a special bottle for babies with that kind of deformity. Breastfeeding is a superpower. All of you right now sitting here, you young women, are making your decision right now. Are you going to breastfeed or bottle feed your babies? If there's one thing you can give your children, one thing, if you know that there's just one thing you need to do to make them smarter and healthier and happier, are you going to do it? Yes. yes. How many are you going to do it? If you can do one thing for your babies, smarter, healthier, happier. Not everybody? <laughs> That one thing is breastfeeding. There's so much research. Go out there and Google it. You guys are so lucky. When I was in high school, we didn't have computers. We didn't have Google. We had to go to the library. Sometimes to find out information, I'd have to find a way to go to the university library. When I was researching my books, I'd have to go to the university of library. I would go to University of Iowa to find the information I needed. So the other thing I'll tell you about breastfeeding, besides the fact that it's a superpower and it is healthier, it does make people happier and it does make people smarter, much smarter, is that it's so much easier for the mom. I mean, you roll over and you give them the breasts. Here's the boob. Go ahead. If you have to get up in the middle of the night at least two times and go to the kitchen, and make that milk and put it in a bottle and the bottle has to be sterilized and the little teeth have to be sterilized it's crazy hard and I wouldn't know about this because I breastfed all my babies I wouldn't know about this except that we adopted a baby six years ago she was starving she was from Sumba and she was so hungry and she was so malnourished at nine months of age that I didn't know if she would be okay 
you know? We sort of accepted that maybe if we took Eliana on, she might not be kind of mentally all there. But, you know, we did all these great things. We massaged her. We did the marma points. We did the brain squeeze. There's a great thing you can do to make yourself smarter is squeeze your own brain. You can also do this. Just try this. This massage right there. It really helps. And then, especially on children, but it works on adults, you can massage your hands in a spiral just right toward your thumb, both sides. So it's opposite way this way is this way. Massage your own hands. So when you're studying for a test, don't just look at the book. Do your brain squeeze, press your smart button, and do your hands. Those are really important. They're simple things and they're free. And you can do them for yourself and you can do them for your children. Really easy. So I just want to prove to you that love is a nutrient. Can you look at the people sitting around you and tell them that you love them? Go ahead. Make some noise. Don't be shy. Ah, you're not doing it. Do it. I love you. I love you so much. How, how are we for time? Okay. So, how does that feel? Do you feel stronger? Do you feel more awake? Yeah. Let's say it all together. One, two, three. I love you. This is Fairfield High School. We can be louder than that. One, two, three. I love you. Yeah. I love you. So, I'm going to have one more question before we... Yes? Aren't there some medical attention that you couldn't provide? That we couldn't provide. Tell me your name. Lolita. Lo Lolita. Lolita. Hi. And your question is, aren't, is there some medical attention we can't provide? Yes. Yes. That's a very good question, Lolita. There is some medical attention we can't provide, which is why we have an ambulance. That ambulance is parked, facing outward. I pressured the Rotary to give me this ambulance, believe me. I've been to so many Rotary meetings. Do any of you have families that are involved in the Rotary? Yes, thank you. I love the Rotary. I made them build me a whole clinic out in Aceh in the tsunami zone. I begged them. And then when they said yes, I said, but there's only one thing. You have to make it all solar powered because we want to go green. And they said, it's more expensive. We can't do that. And I said, but don't give me a clinic that's not solar powered. Because the lights out there, the electricity from the government goes out every night at 8 or 9 o'clock. And it's dark. It's dark all the way from Malibu all the way to Banda Aceh, which is almost the length of California. Except we have this one clinic that's all lit up. So we do have an ambulance, and we do have incredible surgeons that back us up. So if we can't help a person, you know, for example, we can't do major surgery on bones. If someone falls off a motorcycle and has a big cut, we can clean it up, and we can suture them, you know? But if they need their bones set, if they've broken an arm or a leg, then we clean them up and get them in the ambulance down there to the hospital. If they can't give birth naturally, then they need a cesarean birth, and it's still a miracle. Many of you were born by cesarean. It's still a miracle. You know, we try to stand on three feet. One of them is really good medical skills, really good knowledge, really good skills in the science of medicine. Our other foot is respect for nature, which is why we have all these natural things that we do. You know, at our youth center, we have a huge organic garden and we grow organic food and we give it away. And so respect for nature, good foot in the science of medicine. And the third one is called adat in Indonesia. And what it means is spirit, which means whatever makes the mother and the family, whatever makes them feel safe in the world, whoever they pray to, whatever their faith is, we respect that and we, and we hold it up. So if you're Christian, we have beautiful hymns that we sing when your baby's being born. If you're Muslim, we, sit, we do the azan with the family. And if you're Hindu, we do the Gayatri Mantra. So we have, all of us midwives have learned as many songs as we can, because when the babies are being born, we want them to know that they're a miracle. It's not just a medical event, it's a miracle. 
So we sing that baby into the world. So we find that if we really do respect nature, respect the faith of the family, and have our medical skills really, really sharp and really ready to go, then we can do the best service for everyone. So pretty soon your bell's going to ring and you're going to go on to your classes, right? Okay, so I'm going to thank you for being here and listening to some old witch. We saw the brooms up there. I thought, my gosh, this is a great place for a midwife to speak. You know, because lots of people say that midwives are witches, and they used to burn witches at the stake. But they weren't really witches. They were just midwives that knew all about how to help women have babies, how to use the plants for the, the herbal remedies before there were pharmacies, and how to, how to keep the knowledge of our ancestors so that women could give birth naturally and normally. I think all of us are worried about our planet. How many are worried about our planet and about global warming? Yeah, it's the biggest problem of our times. So I want all of you to hold up both your hands. Okay, please do not wait for anyone else to do something about this planet. These hands that I'm looking at, these beautiful hands, you're going to save the world. So give yourself a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Again, we appreciate your work. We appreciate your work here. Thanks for coming back. Group of kids yes, here. Yes, they're, they enjoy it. Good. I hope they had fun. So